episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Great, and we are live. Hello, cellists, and a big thank you to Cello Bello for inviting me to speak to you this evening. Uh, tonight's topic which I'm sure you have already seen, but I will just repeat it, is practical solutions to sound production issues. And this topic was inspired by a comment I made to one of my students who shall remain nameless, even though you know who you are. And the, the comment was to the effect of, uh, please, Stop flinging yourself at the cello and hoping for the best. In other words, it's really, really helpful for all of us to know exactly how we want to make a certain sound or speak a note. Um, and it, it can be daunting at first because there's so, there's so many uh, factors that you have to take into account. But... Um, what I'd like to do tonight is a, just an introduction to a way of thinking about problem solving. So following this slightly obnoxious comment that I made um, was a, a lesson in which we addressed the issues of projection and clarity of diction and resonance in the context of the opening of Prokofiev Cello Sonata. I'm sure anyone who's played that piece knows that there, it, it's, it, can be, it can be difficult to start and, and you have to find the right sound, the right speech, the right resonance. So these challenges, finding these things, are, are topics which we address constantly as students and as teachers and most importantly as performers. So obviously 20 or 30 minutes of discussion is not even a beginning of this topic, but what I wanted to do was to share with you a few practical observations regarding issues which I've encountered again and again in my own study of sound production and which have seemed particularly challenging to my students. Um, I think anyone who performs and teaches needs to, to clarify for themselves and for the students what it means to make sound and to make a sound that will be heard and that the, the character of which will be communicated directly out to, to an audience. So before we begin, what I'd like to do is I would like to um, re let's remind ourselves of a few simple laws of physics. Now, for those of you who are feeling anxious at the thought of physics, I'd like to point out that there are helpful sources. Here's one, physics without mathematics. And that really what physics means is um, it's a way of understanding motion and force and how the physical world works. So we forget that playing the cello is really uh, quite simple in many ways mechanically and should be simple mechanically. One of the things that we all do to ourselves is we, when we're having an emotional response to playing music, um, often that expresses itself as physical tension. And that's not a good idea because that can really interfere with your sound production. And uh, it's, it's important that we, we know that the way we're going to produce sound 
at any given moment is reliable and that we have understood it with with our mind and with the body before we do it. So here's the most basic, basic thing. And I apologize if it seems obvious, but it's one of those sorry, not sorry situations because really what I see so much is um, that we tend to forget that the mechanics of a string vibrating are very simple, but very easily interfered with. So the most obvious thing is once you set a string in motion, you can even see it vibrating from side to side. And our job is to really continue this vibration. So in a frictionless world, the object that's in motion would stay in motion indefinitely. But this is not a friction, frictionless world. And so it's our job to find uh, the, the best way to set a string in motion. So the string is happiest, and I know you all know this, but the string is happiest when you engage it at 90 degrees. And that is very clear this way. But if you stray from that even a little bit, even a little bit, then what you will discover is that you start to shut down the resonance very quickly. So even a little bit of an angle like that doesn't speak directly. And even though it's continuing to vibrate, it's not a particularly good sound. So it's something to bear in mind are extreme examples but even a little bit can can have a, a profound effect on our ability to keep good sound spinning so I'm very wary in my students playing and in my playing of any uh, technique in which uh, we are encouraged to move away from true straight bow. The problem with, with anything like this is that at some point, even if it sounds okay to start with, you're going to have to do what I call emergency roadside repairs. Because if you continue this way, even if you, you're going to, you're going to move through a place where it's not, it's not helping the vibration. And I think that is, in my mind, the best argument for playing with a truly straight bow. And of course, there are exceptions um, in, in, in different mechanics um, of, for instance, in a, in a Bach suite, if you're playing bariolage and you want to make sure that your voice that is not the drone is heard, that works that works that's an exception and and so I encourage anyone who is who is watching and wants to experiment with this to to first of all ascertain what true straight bow is and second of all to really experiment with what it means when you when you deviate from that. At the end, um, after we're finished, I will be posting a couple of uh, links to videos um, that I think really demonstrate the best of the straight bow playing. One is of Casals and the other is of Rostropovich. And um, it's it's really quite extraordinary because they're they're quite different from each other in terms of the type of piece and the sound production. But if you watch them carefully, you see that that's what they do. That's what they do. And and I think it's 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 that's for me the most basic and fundamental part of of 
sound production in this way. So what we're looking for is we're also looking if, if we're trying to keep something in motion, and we talked about the frictionless world, but if you press too hard on the string, if you press too hard on the string, you're also going to shut it down as well. So it, the, the pull and push of the bow, the pull and the push, really keep the string in motion. But if we do too much of downward pressure, you hear how the sound immediately shuts down. The fact is that we don't need that, and the, the lighter and more appropriate the connection here, uh, the, the more the string has the, the ability to vibrate freely. So um, an example of this would be um, if you are squeezing and pressing here, and I'm going to squeeze, you can see that, it immediately shuts down. I think a very common mistake that, that cellists, and, and especially when you're learning something and you're feeling stress, um, or performing something and feeling stress, is feeling that you need to make everything happen from the hand and from your grip here. And I include especially the thumb in that. So that you're finding that you're assuming that this is making power when in fact really the role of the hand and the fingertips is to engage the string, as we said, to get the string started. And to steer that straight bow that we like so much. So anything else really has to be generated from the larger parts of the body. And anything in your body that is interfering with free motion, for instance, a tight high shoulder or an overly lifted elbow that shuts down your motion here, is immediately going to show up in the sound. And it's, it's very simple. And I think if you experiment with it and you, you analyze your own response to wanting to produce more sound or to feeling stressed, then you will discover that you know, these, these, these areas of stress and pressure show up in our bodies and we have to analyze where they are and figure out a better way to do things. So that is a huge part of it, um, is, is really understanding that your power can come from other sources, not from a small, tight area. The other thing that I, I, I want to discuss briefly is the what I see often as a mismatch in vibrato energy or speed or or width um, with bow energy or sound quality volume color so one of the first things that that you have to ask yourself in this situation is am I choosing vibrato that I think my cat just showed up sorry yes am I choosing vibrato that enhances the sound that is tailor-made for for the color for the energy or am I using a vibrato that's a default and the thing that you need to remember too in terms of the physics of it is and it's very simple that the you know sound waves I'll just do this that's a sound wave the waveform looks like that it can be closer together it can have more amplitude any of that but if your vibrato is out of sync with that then 
instead of enhancing that shape, it will start to interfere and shut it down. So, for instance, when you are playing on a lower string and you are looking for, for that kind of a sound, it's a relatively wider, slower vibrato. The minute you pull yourself this way and vibrate with tension, it's a sound, but it's not a particularly resonant and beautiful sound. And this is true on all four strings and in all different string lengths. And it's something that I think we all need to become much, much more sensitive to. You know, it, the, 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 com the old lady complaint is like, oh, young people these days, they all use a fast vibrato and narrow. And it's like, no, that's not entirely true. But there is a tendency now towards what I consider a faster vibrato that's not necessarily tailored to pitch string length it changes all the time and your your ear really has to be your guide in this way angle means a lot so bow angle means a lot and also the angle at which your finger cuts the string so if you're on as i already showed you on the c string if you are cutting the string this way and vibrating, you're vibrating it's one kind of sound but it may not be the optimal sound. Similarly, if we are moving to another string, we will, just as the bow angle will change, straight bow, we'll want to change our left hand angle. Right? But if I were to do that on the G string, with it see see what what you come up with in my experience for the most part for the most part there is a relationship between the straight bow angle cutting the string and the angle of the finger going down on the string so that <laughs> I think is very much something that we want to think about. So what I thought might be fun and interesting was to just take a minute and look at some of the sound production challenges and, and solutions that we might find in Really, one of the most challenging passages for cellists, uh, for sound production and quality and energy management in the chamber music literature, and that is the opening of G Major Brahms' Viola Quintet, first movement. And so you may notice that, uh, you know, this is, let's just say it's a high voltage, high energy, high volume passage. So. One of the things we really don't have time to discuss at all tonight um, directly in, you know, in this part of the presentation is what it means when we're playing quietly uh, with a kind of subtlety. And that's, I welcome anyone who wants to ask about that in the chat after this. But this right now is simply about, is it going to speak? Is the sound quality going to carry? Are you going to avoid forcing? Even though it's very tempting because there are four upper strings playing too loudly at this point. And, um, you, you know, these, it's, it is a genuine challenge. So I'm not going to perform it for you, but I'm going to take you through a bit of a process of what I would be doing as I, if I were working on this with this idea in mind. Clarity, in other words, diction, vibrato energy, 
appropriate vibrato energy. Bow use in order to make shape because you really, it's such a high wire act that you, you don't have time to mess with your bow use. It needs to be direct, clear, and controlled. So any kind of deviation here is um, not in your best interest. Also, if you want to be heard, and that is truly what this is about in this opening, you're going to need to stay away from the fingerboard, which my students have never heard me say. But um, the, the whole point being that there will be a place where you can get volume, clarity, diction, and it's not going to be here. So let's just start with the first note. So here's the first note. So you may notice that I engaged the string to start with. If I played it further up, I've lost resonance and I've lost clarity. So if I'm going to play, if I'm going to challenge the bridge more, one of the first things I have to do is engage the string, but the hand needs to be very, very loose and light because the more I grip the bow, it will force. So that's a really important rule for all of us is volume, energy, and diction are not dependent on force in the hand. And in fact, the more you grab, the less you're going to get. So there we are. Next note. So you notice I engaged the string, but I did not press. And if I were to press and play with a faster, tighter vibrato, nothing comes out. So it's surprising how slow that vibrato can be. It's quite energetic in terms of the motion, but it's not fast. And that's what you, what you really have to remember is that that is a great match for the string, the pitch, and the string length. Okay, so that's something that it's, I encourage you to experiment with a lot. You may notice that when I went to the upper string, I increased my speed. Part of that was because I was going towards the tip, but also because it's a thinner string. If I were to keep it the same, again, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. In tune would be nice. There's a lot of diction. Now, you see how the motion then starts to anticipate what you need. One thing you will not see is my shoulder lifting or my elbow lifting a lot to go to the upper strings. Again, you're stuck. And when the body is stuck, then the sound sticks. So you have to keep asking the cello and asking the string, what do you need? What do you need? If it doesn't work, you have to try something else. And there's certain, as I've said, there are basic principles that, that will give this to us. You know, I, my students have heard me say this so many times, but I, I just need to repeat it because I feel it's so important. You know, the relationship that you have with, with the cello, with the string, with the bow, has to be one in which 
So I say it's like any other human relationship, um, which is you have to listen, you have to be open to trying new things. You can't assume that one way is the answer because it will never be the same. And the more you ask that question, and the more you respond to it physically and teach yourself what that response should be, the easier it is to play. And when we get under performance pressure, that's when we have to really call upon these things that we've taught our body. Because you can't be giving yourself instructions. You can't be, I mean, unless it's a, what we call process cue, helpful, short, thing that will flip you to where you want to be. But you can't be doing math. You can't be figuring it out. You can't, as, as I said to my dear student, you can't fling yourself at the cello and hope for the best because you really have to understand. So here we are. to grow so I had to ask myself what tools do I have other than messing with the sounding point or pressing so you saw motion and you probably saw an increase of vibrato here <laughs> Sometimes doing less in order to do more is extremely helpful. Now we would immediately go to a slower, deeper bow. And that's a kind of place where you have to understand that you can't use the sound, same sounding point for everything. Again, it's very practical in that it's like if I keep it, it's going to force. So lower, lower sounding point, or I guess that's a higher one. Yeah. Now, right? So that immediately helps you understand what the needs of the string are. Not the bridge. I did not move towards the bridge this way because then I would have to somehow repair that. I moved towards the bridge this way which keeps the that same relationship straight bow to string. When I'm in so again I'm moving towards the bridge, but I'm also not, I'm not actually increasing the vibrato in a tight way. I'm actually, I'm actually widening it out. So that again, what we don't want to do is get stuck with tension. Again, we're creating room in order to be able to grow. Now, one thing that you may not be able to see on this screen is the fact that I'm also using the relationship of the body moving the cello and the string to the bow. So there's never that sense of because that, again, it, it, it gets you into a situation of real pressure. But here, so I'm moving the string to the bow. It helps keep the hand light, too, because you're getting your weight from behind instead of from above. Freedom of motion. So anything.
anything other than that is going to shut down my sound. <laughs> and you have to understand the needs of the C and the needs of the A. Here comes another one. Notice how it's a completely different use energetically. I hope this makes sense to you. On that note, it looks like we should probably go to the chat. I hope you have questions. I'm happy to answer them. I'm now going to click on the chat. Oh, very good. Okay, this is a question that is an excellent one. Uh, how do you recommend a student cellist monitor themselves for proper bow angle, especially if they do not have a mirror available in their practice space? I often recommend my students use their phones in selfie mode. Any tips? It's a great question. Um, and especially one of, one of the few th good things that came out of the pandemic is that people uh, spent a lot of time watching themselves on screens. So your idea about having your students use the phone is an excellent one. The problem is that sometimes people don't know. It's hard to identify what a straight bow is. So there are some, some uh, hacks that you can use. What's especially great is on the C string and the A string. You have some angles that will really show you what's straight. So if you match the angle, if you make your bow parallel to this part of the bridge or this part of the fingerboard and maintain that, that is truly straight. Similarly, on the A string, the problem for kids, for students, is that you know, some of them don't know what a 90 degree angle is. You can say it makes an H between the strings. That's a, a great one too for, for little ones. But it doesn't look like a 90 degree angle from above. And so having these reference points is great. The G string, you, it's not so much, this is not so helpful here. But what you can do, If your sounding point starts to drift, it means you're not playing with a straight bow. And the other thing that was helpful to me, and, and it's very challenging, is the bowing on the bridge technique, where you play on the string but on the bridge. And if you fall off the bridge, it means you're no longer playing with a straight bow. I think it's, uh, I think it is, a, a really difficult thing to teach, but but I think you're off to a good start with the idea of having them watch themselves. And here is another question. Hello, I'm a beginner with small hands and I'm struggling to play fast passages without strain. Do you have any tips, please? That's a great, great question. And I think just to, to say it's very important when when you're teaching or when you are learning to understand that every body is unique and that what works for a, a larger person or someone with larger hands is not necessarily going to work for you. So, but one thing I would say is this, uh, I have a very narrow, I have long fingers, but I have a very, very narrow palm. 
So, for instance, even playing in, in first position, you'll understand why I'm saying this in a minute, um, I have to play almost as if I'm extending between, between fingers. Now, what that necessitates is not squeezing with your left thumb. I'm not suggesting, you know, taking it off like this, but we know that when we extend, we release the thumb from the neck and open the hand. So one thing that may be causing the problem for, for you is that if you're grabbing, if you're grabbing this way and you're trying to play fast, first of all, there's way too much pressure within the hand. See what it feels like to let go of the thumb a little bit when you're moving. So that you can't see my thumb, but if I, if I press, it's very hard, it starts to strain. So that you can move and, and the hand and the thumb are more released. Here's another question. Uh, do you have any thoughts on sound production with playing Baroque music and Baroque cello? If so, what are some of the similarities and changes? Very, very good question. I think the Baroque bow behaves really differently from our modern bow. And um, the, the thing that you have to remember is that any kind of, what I was saying earlier, pressure in the sound is, is not going to work in Baroque music. So if you, are, if you are simulating that with a modern instrument and you're feeling the bow naturally releases becomes very important clarity and release I actually feel like when we're playing Baroque music on modern cello that we should pretty much do the same thing that we would do if we were playing it with a Baroque bow and a Baroque cello I mean we have more power um, we don't have to worry about the gut uh, not speaking in the same way but you have to treat it similarly because again it's, it's a question, as I said earlier, of, of um, when I said we have to be sensitive to the needs of the instrument. I also mean that when I say uh, about the style or the composer. You, you, can't, uh, you can't just apply modern techniques to Baroque music. You always have to be asking that question, like whether or not you are absolutely scholarly and, and, and have the equipment. The music demands a certain touch and so I hope that I hope that's helpful to you. Um, here's another excellent question. Thank you for your time. Oh you're welcome. Can you please explain how we can adapt fast to different conditions and sizes of concert halls and rooms? I find that in some rooms and venues, I cannot hear the resonance and find sound production difficult. So that, that's a very good and very practical question. So on the most um, sort of obvious, let's take two extremes. If, you're, if, if you are playing in a very resonant hall, Obviously, what you need to do is you need to um, find more clarity in your stroke. Um, you need to make sure that you are not, you know, indulging in the resonance and over, over playing. Those are what we call, uh, <laughs> those are what we call high self-esteem halls, you know, those really resonant ones but they require a certain care um, in that way. The flip side of that is when you're playing in um, a very, very dry hall. And I remember playing in a, in a hall once in Maryland and 
one of my colleagues described it as <laughs> that the sound ended before your bow actually finished the stroke. That's a place where you're going to be tempted to uh, force and to press because you can't, you're not finding, you're not feeling sound coming back to you. But that's where you actually have to play with your most beautiful sound and your most not forced sound. So even if you can't hear the resonance, you have to create it for yourself. I try honestly to practice in fairly dry rooms uh, because number one, um, those are low self-esteem <laughs> rooms. So you have to work really hard to make your most beautiful sound. But the, what is shocking, I think, is if, if you're always practicing in a very flattering space and then, um, and then you're in an unflattering space, it can be really difficult. And so what I would say is um, better to get used to making a beautiful sound in a space that doesn't give a lot back to you and then be pleasantly surprised if you are... Um, in a lovely space. It's if I hope that makes sense to you. Um, again, it's it's great to practice for the worst case scenario, always. Okay, I'm laughing now. Here's a question that says, "Do you have any advice for up bow chords?" I'm currently struggling with the Strauss Sonata. Thank you. So um, there's been quite a debate. One of my students. At Manhattan School is working on the Strauss Sonata and we had a lesson and I said you know what play play the both chords down bow finish it really well keep your resonance going and do a, the fastest possible retake and then um, that person went into a chamber music coaching with someone who shall remain nameless um, who, my husband, who immediately said, oh no, you need to do down bow, up bow. So let me address your question and, and it will spark some debate in my house for sure. So let's start with an easy one, the C major one. So, so what you want to make sure of is you need to understand what you need here and what you need here. Probably what's bothering you is my guess is that you may be, your arm may be up too high. And you can feel free to, 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 to write um, in the chat if this is not, if I'm not addressing the issue. But most of the time you feel like on an up bow that you're not able to get the kind of power that you need. So if you have, that to me weakens it. I think you need to drop it back. Does that make sense? and then drop it down. The other thing that, that really, 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 really helps is to avoid trying to make the sound from the front body. From there. What you want to feel when you drop it down is that you're really engaging the back body. So when I drop it, I'm feeling that. I hope that's helpful to you. Keep your vibrato in motion. Find a way to not stop. Let me know in the chat if that makes sense. Now, I'm losing one of the questions. Ah. <laughs> This may be off topic, but if you're coming up on a shift from, say, 
first to sixth position. <laughs> you know this is my favorite topic, person who wrote this. Do you position your left elbow in anticipation of the shift, or do you more try to always be in a good default left elbow position? Okay, that's not quite clear to me what you're asking, but I think what you're asking is, if I'm moving from... Right? There's a new message. So you may notice that what I don't do is have my elbow low and then raise it in anticipation of moving. This is something I learned in a master class from Lynn Harrell that I found instantly useful and never went back from it. In other words, if, you, if you're about to play here, the simplest, the simplest motion is going to be one straight line. The most complicated motion is to be shifting, raising, going, or going like this before you shift. So what he said and what I believe is without getting you know, extreme, keep the elbow level pretty much the same so that all you're doing is opening the, level, the, the elbow and letting the hand fall. That's it. Okay, hope that was helpful. Now... Do you think the amount of contact between the cellist body and the cello has an impact on the sound produced? Does a lot of contact dampen the sound? So that's interesting. Um, I do think that it can. I think that anytime you're squeezing the cello in any way, um, for instance, if you're squeezing with your knees, Again, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, the whole system is vibrating. And so if you dampen any part of it, you have to be careful. I mean, we use that like squeezing with the right knee. If we have a, a, a wolf and that, that is helpful because it eliminates some of the vibration. So that should tell you something right there. I tend, I use, I use a pad. Um, partly because I got tired of sweating on my cello, but um, but also it's I keep the contact minimal and quite light. I also use um, you may have noticed that I tend to bring the string to the bow, so you know that necessitates not having a lot of squeezing. In other words, if I'm playing as we were doing. If I'm squeezing, it's going to be hard to move. So I hope that's helpful. And <laughs> I'm currently having trouble finding a good way to hold the cello. Is it okay if I position the cello lower than others? You mean than other people do probably, right? And so again, I think Everybody is different. Everybody is different. And um, you will see people who play with an extraordinarily long end pin. Um, and there's like the Rostropovich end pin where it's, you know, the Stahlhammer where it's more flat like this. My rule is this. I, I want to be able, based on the end pin length, to keep my body open here. I don't want to be reaching down to the cello, nor do I want to be reaching up. I have what feels to me like the best, um, the, the best end pin length for my arm, my shoulder to arm length, and based on my torso. So what I think if you find yourself positioning the cello lower and your finding that you're reaching like this, that's going to have a big impact on your ability to really move the bow freely.
You don't want to run out of bow because your arm is extended too much. So I would experiment and I would, um, I would find, first of all, what is your, your correct arm length, what feels right to you, what gives you access to that, these sounding points without feeling like you're reaching or choking up. And just a, a word of caution. Um, it's really tempting to be changing, you know, uh, changing end pin length, um, thinking that that may solve some problems or eliminate them. But I think really what you have to do is you have to, you have to find what is the best use for your body. And the caution is this, when you change your end pin length dramatically, you're really changing the way you use your body. And that's when you have to be really careful about injury. You do not want to change your use in so dramatically and immediately go after that because really you're, you're, you're used to playing in a certain way. And when, when the whole height of what you're doing changes, be careful. Okay. How does a flat bow hair impact, oh, I love this topic, impact the ease difficulty of string crossings? And how can you cross strings with ease while maintaining a high volume at the tip of the bow, specifically in the Brahms Quintet? Okay, so here's what you have to, to know, really know. So in general, flatter bow hair is, is very, very helpful when crossing strings, particularly when crossing strings rapidly, because when you have more hair on the string, then you see how if I were to go to the side, it's immediately a much bigger motion. So right there, it minimizes it. And if I'm at the frog and I'm on the side and I'm trying to cross strings, it becomes quite dramatic as is there if I'm on the side of the hair. The flatter hair allows you to maintain your contact and to minimize the angle. So what you were asking about... See, I, I just played it on the side and I felt like I was losing contact. If I keep it flatter... You see that? crossed a little bit more on the side because if I were to again it's too much arm motion does that I hope that's helpful uh, because at the tip oh here's another one for the, you know the classic the Dvorak so if I were to play it normally I would say flat of the hair at the tip may throw your arm up but in this case, the benefits outweigh the problems. Flatter. It just, it stabilizes your use and it really sticks you to the string. Okay, here's a little tiny question. <laughs> How can one develop trust and smoothness of tone while addressing the needs of each note on the cello throughout registers and positions in both lyrical and fast playing. <laughs> so that's from one of my students. I'm like, thank you so much for doing that. Um, you know what I would say to that? You know, the, your most important tool is listening. You, you really have to use your ear so much and and you have to experiment based on what you hear. Because one thing that happens all the time is, is when sometimes when, when I say to my students, you know, um, each string has different requirements and each 
string length based on you know where you are has a different requirement and and then you know I can see the math anxiety starting right away but honestly what what you want to do is you you listen you need to have information about the mechanics of playing as we're talking about tonight and this was like the tiniest tiniest scratch of the surface um, and but you train the body to to do the right thing by guided by the ear and that is what I that's how I you know when you say how do you how can one develop trust well what it is is that you understand that if you put the bow on the string in a certain way and engage the string a certain way and vibrate that you're going to get what you want I think the thing that is really difficult which is the genesis of this whole discussion um, is is not knowing what's going to come out then you don't trust and and sometimes it's hard when you feel stressed or pressured but the the point is if if the body is trained the body is much smarter than you think it is and if it has been trained properly and you know what you're doing that's when confidence happens and um, it's, it's, I think it's really important to start with the most simple and basic ideas of, of how does one produce sound. As you say, smoothness of tone. What are the needs of the notes? Well, when you feel it and you hear it, then you reinforce it by repetition so that you know that if you put your bow on the string and do that, it will come out. I hope that's helpful. And Charles, good to see you too. Thank you for your comments. Are there any more questions? These have been excellent questions. Questions for our practice room series below. And <laughs> okay. So you're going to think this is a joke, but when you say what is on your music stand right now, actually this is the thing that's always on my music stand, which is my tuner. And that is how when you say what is the first thing you do on the cello every day? Well, uh, to say I, you know that I tune is 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 uh, a little bit uh, flippant, but what I do is I I tune, and then I I really try to find the the resonance of the instrument, and so I will free associate for a little while. I don't jump into, you know, scales, arpeggios, etudes. I will honestly I mean and and I will play scales. I will I will practice shifting exercises, but I what I'm doing is I'm reminding myself, I'm reminding myself of how I want to feel. And the, the, the analogy for me with that is um, what dancers do when they go to class, which is that they, they start with the simplest and most basic um, motions, and it's a prescribed series. I don't. I don't do that so much. But I try to move absolutely from the uh, from the simplest possible way of making sound. And the reason why my tuner 
is on the, um, the is on my stand is that I also do a lot of work with a drum because I think it really helps um, refine your listening. So that's that's a very important part of, of my practice time. And let's see. Why do you practice? What drives and motivates you? Anything that helped during the pandemic? Well, why I practice is, it's the same answer as what do I enjoy the most about practicing, which is that I love figuring things out and I love understanding what the cello needs and what my body needs and what the music needs and I love experimentation and and as I said problem solving um, what motivates me well obviously um, if you're performing you want to make sure that you you are you understand the needs of the piece and and what how you know how you get yourself from point A to, to performing. But honestly, I'm not performing that much these days. What I'm doing a lot of is teaching. And what motivates me is to help my students as much as possible and to understand what they need as much as possible. And so I'm constantly thinking about them when I'm practicing and trying to to figure out based on what their bodies are doing and what what challenges they're facing, what would be most helpful. That's honestly what helped during the pandemic was I spent so much time with my students. Um, obviously not in person, but that was what kept so many of us going. And there, you know, it was it was definitely a source of inspiration and comfort and a sense of some kind of normalcy. Um, is all of my class practicing classical? Yes, all of my practicing is classical. Are there inspirations outside of the genre? I love to listen to all kinds of music, but I don't play all kinds of, of music. Uh, how do you cultivate inspiration in the practice room? What motivates you? Well, <laughs> honestly, I think I've answered that question already um, in terms of what I'm looking for when I'm practicing and how, how I want to use my knowledge that I gain to help my students. Um, another thing that... I, the just part of the question from before I also do a lot of listening to music that is not cello music I don't think I really listen to very much cello music at all at this point in my life I do you know look to certain performers for inspiration and, and I love that but um, one thing that inspires me a lot is is stepping away from the cello repertoire of any given composer and learning more about it and finding how that is going to really affect any interpretation. Um, here is, okay. Is it okay to mix Boeing's while playing Bach, i.e. use legato mixed with staccato to break up the phrasing? Starker talked about not doing this. I'm not sure I'm understanding um, the question. I apologize. Um, if you're referring to looking at um, Boeings that are generally, I mean, there's so much debate about what, what the Boeings are based on the Anna Magdalena. But um, if you're talking about deviating from that, um, I, I think that you need to take a look at the original, s try to figure out what is the musical, could be the musical reason for legato versus staccato, um, and make your own decision. 
I think there's more leeway than you think. I apologize for not understanding the question entirely. Um, so here's from a younger student who's just gotten a new cello and wants to know how my new better cello will help your playing. Well, first of all, congratulations on getting your new cello. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I hope you love it. You know, there are things that you're going to learn from playing. I'm assuming this is a full size cello that you're going to learn about sound production that um, you will absolutely be thrilled by and surprised by. Um, and if it's a significantly, so that will inspire you, I think, in many ways. And if it's a significantly more, um, you know, colorful or sensitive instrument, that will also inspire you to find more color and more ways of, of expressing in the music. So congratulations. I, I look forward to hearing that cello sometime. Um, do I have any exercises I recommend for improving sound production? Well, this is interesting. <laughs> um, one of the things that really improves sound production, and, and this I think is not the answer that you're expecting, but um, my understanding of, of how the body works of supporting from core, and yet that is a hint right there, and really um, feeling um, the back body working to make sound, which is can be difficult to wrap your mind around, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and being physically fit is exercise, and I, uh, during the pandemic, I did a lot of Pilates, and I found that was incredibly helpful um, in terms of, of producing better sound. Um, and, and of course, there are like, I, we could talk for 10 hours, 100 hours on what you need to do, um, exercises that you can do at the instrument to really find sound that you want. But I think it basically, what, what I'm going to say is, it starts with really understanding your own body and understanding what it means to energize with the whole body so that you're not getting into a situation where, as I said earlier, you're pressing with the hands, you're pressing here, you're locking, your, your free motion. And that's the most, I think it's actually the most important thing. And it's the one that people really, really ignore way too much. So moving on, I am currently learning Shostakovich's first concerto. Congratulations. And my upper back gets really tense as I'm trying to get this strong sound. I know it won't come out of tension, but I have trouble relaxing the back. Do you have any thoughts and advice? Thank you. So it's very interesting. Um, what it sounds like is, for instance, that. So uh, you have to make sure that you're not, again, in terms of your posture, hunching over in any way, pressing, causes so much tension. And then what you're doing is you're, you're pulling against the tension and it, it literally starts to snowball. Make sure that you are bringing the string to the bow. Make sure that you're sitting properly. Make sure that you're not squeezing. One of the videos that I'm going to send to the administrator to post um, is Rostropovich playing uh, this very concerto that you're talking about. Now, I know you're thinking, well, we can't all be Rostropovich, but it's really fascinating to watch. 
Number one, because his bow is perfectly straight at all times. And so is the entire violin section, you'll see it. But also that it's remarkable how, how energized he is, but how light the hands are. And you'll see him um, at various points when he's playing, like the passage that I was talking about. If you watch it, you'll see as he goes out in the bow, he's basically holding the bow like this. He's not grabbing. And so it's all released. It's moving easily. I think that would help you. Sometimes, you know, immobility in this way makes it impossible to relax. So stay in motion. Make sure you're feeling your power this way rather than this way. Okay. And now... I notice your bow hold directly involves the fingertips. Yes. Is there a way to engage the string huh, in a direct and informed way without a bow hold that is primarily based on fingertip bow contact? In other words, I think maybe what you're asking is, this is also a bow hold that you will see people use. So, um, for every you know thing that, that that I have said, there will be someone who will say the opposite and who can probably do it well. So that's but for me, and I'm talking only about myself, I don't find a direct and informed way to 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 contact the string without the sense of fingertips, because the more the more you are in this position, the tighter your thumb tends to get. I find that it is very difficult to have a released and useful thumb that can move when you're holding the bow like that. And especially as you move out in the bow, it tends to lead, lead, lead to that. So my answer is I don't, I don't teach that and I don't play that way. Um, I find that, again, that that's the most, that's what works for me. Okay, hope that's helpful. Okay, resuming in the practice room. In your mind, what is it that makes an effective practice session? I think it, there has to be a, the right balance between um, planning exactly what you're going to do and um, and mapping it out. As my husband says, work expands according to the time allotted. And so interestingly, I became a much better practicer um, after I had children and I was trying to do everything and I had about this much practice time. And so you really have to be efficient. You have to plan. You have to know when, when enough is enough. Um, but I find it's, you have to know your own mental limits too. There are some people who can focus for a very long time effectively. There are other people who need, really need breaks more often and that's fine. So, um, is there a particular practice method that you swear by that has remained of constant value for you? Uh, 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 go to strategy. Um, honestly, I feel like um, my practicing has evolved over the years. The constant value for me would be the um, the that that what I was showing you about the first things that I do, where I remind myself of what it is that, how I want to move, how I want to be, how I want to feel, how I want the cello to sound. What are the best ways to prevent injury? Well, the most important way, <laughs> number one, is um, make sure that you are taking the best possible care of your body in terms of nutrition, sleep, you know, we're all stressed these days, but trying to not bring your stress to the instrument. The other 
Another one that's seriously important is to make sure that you get your heart rate up before you sit down to play. And there are many different ways that you can do that. I do a combination of um, arm circles, you know, above the heart, this. I do quite a lot of them. And standing crunches, which I do not do in front of other people. And, um, or I will run up and down the stairs in my house to get my heart rate up. Very, very, very important. But one of the most important things you can do is to pay attention to your body. Don't, if something doesn't work, don't assume if it feels bad, repeating it 10 times is not going to make it feel better. It's just going to hurt you. So making sure that, that you're actually paying attention to how you feel. And again, do not do that, you know, heroic thing of, oh, I haven't practiced in a week, so now I should practice for four hours a day. Really bad idea. That's really the road to injury. This is, you have to build things up gradually and make sure that you're, you're really supporting your body as best you can. How many hours a day should one practice, quality or quantity? Well, it depends on what you want to get done. So I, I've already said that for me at this point, it's about quality. And just because you're practicing for four to five hours a day doesn't mean that it is of quality. So I think you have to monitor yourself very carefully. I would, I, I think when you're a student that you need to spend a certain number of hours per day at the instrument and it is not eight, it is not six. If you can't get your work done in three to four hours, you need to take a look and, you know, occasionally more if you need it, but never all at once. You need to take a look at what you're doing. You really do. Um, and be very, very careful about, about excessive hours of work. Oh, there are lots more. <laughs> okay, I don't even know how to answer this. What is your balance between technique and repertoire? Um, so I think that's asking when you're practicing, do you, do I, um, do I spend some time on technique and some on repertoire? Well, I'll spend time on scales and arpeggios and shifting and bowing exercises. Um, but I, what that really is is in the service of whatever repertoire I'm learning. So at this point in my life, I'm not practicing etudes and, um, and you know, I'm not spending hours uh, drilling technique. What I'm trying to do is refine what I do and use that technique in the service of the repertoire. How do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? Again, organization, organization and being very realistic about what I call it triage, like what you can leave alone, what's working for you. Don't keep repeating that endlessly. What needs emergency attention and that what will be okay with a certain minimum amount of attention. So that's important. How do you start learning a new piece? Um, well, my dear colleague Peter Stumpf said once, and I completely agree with him, what do you do when you learn a new piece? I learn the notes. I, I will literally sit and play the notes, and then I will figure out how I'm moving between the notes. I know that sounds really simplistic, but it's the truth. What I don't do is try to jump into full out music making right away. Because I think, again, it's about training your body how to move what you're doing. And also, you know, I, I, learn, I try to learn the notes in tune. That's really important. How does this differ between chamber orchestral and solo rep? No difference at all, in my opinion. I think you have to approach it all the same way. 
How has your practicing evolved over the years or even recently? Is there anything that has surprised you? Here's what has surprised me, and it is <laughs> absolutely the truth, which is that I find that because I spend so much time with my students and, and at the instrument, that um, first of all, I don't have time to practice many hours a day. But what I found is that my playing has maintained itself well without that. So it's not that I, you know, I'm trying to get away with the minimum, but I think what it is is, again, the awareness of the body, how you want to be reminding yourself of that. Um, is there anything we haven't dis... Oh, with such a big workload, how do you avoid burnout and maintain balance? Well, I don't think I have ever felt truly burned out. Part of it is that I'm constantly fascinated by what my students are doing and how we're working together. And they're always new and interesting problems to solve. I still feel like I would, I'm <laughs> still trying to figure out how to play in tune. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to learn about the best way to play the cello. And more importantly, I'm fascinated by, by the music and I'm never ever bored by the music that we're working on. I feel it's a, it's a privilege. So no burnout there. Uh, it says, is there anything we haven't discussed that you feel is vital to productive creative practice sessions? Well, you know, again, I find inspiration when I'm working on, for instance, a Beethoven sonata. I find inspiration from other pieces of Beethoven, from Beethoven piano sonatas, for instance, or string quartets. Um, when I'm working on Brahms, I will listen to Brahms songs. Um, it's, it's really important to not get stuck just thinking that this composer exists to <laughs> write a piece for the cello. Um, if you're working on a Britain solo sonata, then you owe it to yourself to listen to operas. You owe it to yourself to listen to the song cycles. You owe it to yourself to listen to string quartets of Britain. So that you feel like, you know, you, you actually have a basis for making a musical decision. That you are in dialogue with the composer while you're while you're working you're not just like okay this is i'm going to do this because it happens to work or it feels right but because there's a really important musical reason for that and it's informed by your knowledge with the composer and your relationship with the composer one last question how can you talk about finger independence in the left hand that is an interesting question so I probably am not answering it the way you want, but when I was a kid, one of the worst things I had to do was to work on those Cosman exercises. You know, those that are supposed to build finger independence and build strength and, and all of this. And, and I always, I found it actually made things worse and it made, it didn't, my hand felt so tight after that. So it's interesting. I don't think so much about finger independence in the left hand, unless I'm playing a fast passage. <laughs> But what I what I really think of is I don't I don't think it is absolutely the best thing to be thinking about exercising the individual finger. I really try to deliver 
the finger to the string with the arm and not this way. I think it, it's, it leads to dangerous injury at times. I also um, tend to play, if I'm playing with my fourth finger, I will support it with the third finger. Third finger I support with the second. Second I support with the first. So I'm never ever doing that. I hope that's helpful. It's a big topic. So um, I think that's the end of the questions and I, I thank Cello Bello for giving me the opportunity to meet with all of you and to discuss some, some things that I find very important. I'm going to send um, the two videos that I think illustrate just what it means to play with absolutely great bow to string contact, great beautiful vibrato, fantastic physical use, and it's all in the service of the music. And um, ultimately that's why we're doing all of this anyway. So be well, play around with this, see if it's helpful, and uh, thanks so much to Cello Bello.